We were talking uh, about the ceiling, but the polar bear work that I started to do around sport hunting really kind of, I would say, sequenced from that. Not directly, but I became really curious about, you know, I, when I did the ceiling stuff, I had worked with, to some degree, done research on white organizations. And I thought, why not look at hunters? It, they're 180 degrees different from people in the animal rights and conservation organizations. But they were a group of people they, who I thought might very well be able to appreciate Inuit in, because they shared this, for, hunter, for sport hunters, a passion. I won't say with Inuit it's a passion. It's a life way for Inuit. Uh, and also, they were an important source of money. Uh, you know, most of the money that flows into northern communities, it, I, even in the year 2000, mining was, had not taken off the way it is today, especially with Baffin iron, iron mines. So they represented, if you, in Clyde River, for instance, they had, uh, their quota had been reduced in the mid-1980s, I think wrongly, from 42 to 20, uh, and eventually up to 21 or 22 but uh, there's not much else to do in Clyde. You can work for the Hudson's Bay Company. Well, by that time it was the, uh, the Northern, Northwest Company, for the municipal government. But as you know, you know, jobs in the North grow arithmetically and the population's growing exponentially. So there are never enough jobs for people who may or may not, not just make money, who may actually want a job. There's also, who you're related to can affect whether you get a job or not and how old you are versus a, a young family versus old family. Anyway, uh, I thought, well, polar bear hunters bring in a significant amount of money and Clyde would sometimes sell eight to 10 of its polar bear tags at $20,000 a pop, 200 grand when it was going to people who probably, in some cases, were only drawing welfare and family allowance you know, it gave them a lot more latitude in terms of what they could spend money on. They didn't have to, basically when you're living family allowance and welfare, there isn't enough money to buy gas and parts for machines, for instance. You're, you're living out of the store. But when you can hunt, you know, you have nicked to enough real food, which then ties into the sharing as well. You can always get food, but I think everyone likes to also be a giver from at least from time to time. So, uh, um, the po I wanted to look at sport hunters in part as how they fit in what was in my mind a, this idea of mixed economy. Not too often, I felt, especially through the '80s into the '90s, what the economy of the North was described as a dual economy money and whatever else was going on that didn't make money. And clearly, money was a resource, you know, as it is down south, but in a much more visceral way in the north. If, even if you want to participate in the non-monetized sector of the economy, you have to be able to have some access to money. I w uh, I'm riffing off from Polar Bear for a moment. One of my students who's now at, uh, INRS, the research group here, Magali Quintel Merino, did a wonderful study on the importance of women for hunting as suppliers of money because they share the money the most, if, particularly if they're employed. Men don't have to work because time becomes a currency for hunters, splitting with work. So guys, I, Full, well, I'll get to this because it's my current project. But uh, anyway, if you ever have time, find her dissertation by, by Magali Quintel Marino. Wonderful piece of work. In any case, the polar bear work was 
in a way to focus on economy. And I think, as I mentioned, it was initially funded pretty modestly by Safari Club International, who really wanted, <laughs> to be honest, what they wanted was a report that would show that sport hunting had a conservation purpose, something I'm not quite sure I ever agreed with. Uh, although I've worked with people, and we've published articles where I guess you could construe, there are circumstances where hunting does have, some, have a conservation purpose. But flat out, what was going on in the North was trophy hunting, and none of the trophy hunters thought of it as conservation. It was a skin on the floor or a, on the wall. So uh, I, I spent about three, I would say three, four years and one of the things I wanted to do, actually, was related to the economy of sport hunting, was how to get more money into the communities. If those guys were paying forty or fifty thousand dollars, with half or so, even more, going to wholesalers, why not? How could we get all the money into the community? And that's really one of the things I went into this project to try to figure out. But the project itself was to find out if sport hunters really could appreciate Inuit culture. After all, they were, and, and they were experiencing with probably the best people they would never otherwise have met. I mean, serious hunters, really serious hunters, uh, what you might call Inumarit, if you really believe there's such a thing as Inumarit as a term, you know. Uh, I've never heard of an Inuk describe themselves as Inumarit, except the ones that you know aren't. <laughs> So, uh, and so I wound up interviewing some 125 hunters. And one of the questions I always ended my interviews with was, if it w didn't involve hunting, would you go back north? And only one hunter said that she would. I had two women in my sample. It wasn't a sample. It was whoever I could get to talk to me. And she had hunted out of Arctic Bay, and she got a bear. And she said, oh, I'd go back in a second. She was a rancher from Wyoming, um, a widow, I guess grandchild, but she was a sport hunter. And she had hunted in Africa and so on. Uh, but most of the work with those guys was getting their biographies. And it was clear that, you know, sport hunting was a passion. And many of these guys, as I mentioned, had been to Africa multiple times, you know. They all had their quicks and quirks. Uh, some even had a philosophy. Uh, but, uh, you know, by and large, it was getting the biggest bear you could find. Just as a, a little anecdote, back in the early 90s, a hunter from Alabama, bow hunter, went up to Clyde and he got an 11 foot 3 inch bear. And he rode it up in one of the either sports of field or outdoor life. And Clyde, in a year, received over 100 applications to, for sport hunt. They could have basically booked sport hunts for 10 years. They would normally sell 8 to 10 hunts, if that. Sometimes fewer. But there was always a clientele until climate change disrupted everything or what people thought it was doing to polar bear. In any case, um, uh, it was an interesting experience, uh, but I found that by and large, you know, the, the articulation was the act of hunting, but the motivation was different. And very rapidly, in, in sitting down with sport hunters, one time in Clyde River, there were three sport hunters stuck by weather. They had been out hunting. They had each gotten a bear. And I happened to be walking past the hotel uh, when they were being brought into town. They had not hunted together, but they all came in within a few hours of each other. And at the time, there was only one hotel in Clyde. There's 10 beds at that time. And uh, they all wanted to get out. I mean, the f now that they had their bear, I'm, I'm blowing this pop stand. I'm getting out of here. So I figured, what the hell? I'll talk to these guys. And I went in and we schmoozed. And... It was really interesting. For about the first hour, they talked about the guys who guided them, mostly positively, a little bit. So, I mean, they would say things like, the guy really did not handle his dogs. Well, good luck. You don't know anything about dogs. 
for God's sakes. But then it became really about who got the bigger bear and stuff like that. And very little about Inuit. Um, I probably shouldn't have this recorded, but I, I, I went out of my way to maximize their presence in the community. A friend of mine, an elder, used to make ulus and uh, harpoon heads. And so I casually one day brought a harpoon in to show these guys. And he used to sell these things for $20. He also made cribbage boards and stuff. But I just like, so I was sitting there having tea with them because they had to wait three days for the airplane. And I had, took this thing out of my pocket. And I knew he had a, about 20 or 30 ulus and maybe 15 harpoon heads. And everybody really, oh, that's really interesting. And these guys basically are looking for curios to take back to give to friends. You know, I don't know what, we, you know, we might, a refrigerator magnet or something to give to somebody from a visit to, I don't know, Las Vegas. <laughs> but uh, so I wound up selling these guys harpoons. I think I probably sold almost all his ulus and probably most of his harpoons for $50 a piece for him. He was furious at me. He thought I had robbed him. And I said, look, you know, you're, you've got an old age pension because a few years before I had figured out how old he was and that he had never collected a pension. He had worked for the RCMP for many years back in the 30s and 40s. And I said, these guys, I mean, this is nothing. <laughs> this is not money to them. These, these are playthings. And he really thought that was strange. But anyway, he forgave me. So the polar bear sport hunting, but it also took me into uh, what eventually became a rather fraught relationship with the polar bear biologist community with one or two exceptions. And uh, basically my idea was, first getting back to the economy, was probably the only way to capture a majority, if not all the money would be to organize a system where, because as you know, polar bears are, they're, they're in management uh, zones that have no relation to reality. But, so three communities, for instance, Clyde hunts Baffin Bay, so does Kikatajewak, so does Pondale, so does West Greenland, was to at least, and there were sport hunts being run out of these communities each year, maybe not the same number, but you wind up ultimately communities undercutting each other to get clients. My thought was, why not run it like an eBay auction? Put it on computer. Each community, at this, a couple of weeks before the season starts, you each put up three tags with bidding starting at $25,000. And the, it'll be up for 48 hours. And it's updated every hour. And maybe if you don't want the GN to run it, because nobody trusted the GN to get anything right, why not have uh, NTI run it? It really wouldn't be that big a deal. And they probably have greater technical skills. But the thing was to keep communities from trying to undercut each other to get clients and to capture as much of the money, except the airfares, that could be brought into a community. And after, uh, there's a, the append, uh, there's like an epilogue in, in the uh, uh, polar bear hunting book. Uh, but I wrote up a report that uh, to the GN and to NTI, and the day I finished it was the day that polar bear became, became publicized as a symbol of climate change. And everything blew up. And Again, this is probably something I shouldn't say to be recorded, but I believe that there is a lot of collusion between the climate change people and the polar bear biologists. Polar bear bio biologists represent the species they study. That's their, their interest. Some of them may get to know about people and animals, but mostly from a southern perspective. There are a few polar bear biologists, uh, one of them being, well, he's a close friend of mine, so I'm biased, but Mitchell Taylor. Well, I thought Mitch over the years went from being a dumb biologist to a really smart one. He knew a ton about polar bear. <laughs>
although he had worked with Inuit, he had really not given much thought to the relationship. And, and I thought, Mitch, he grew up to know a lot. <laughs> And I learned a lot about polar bear biology <laughs> with him. But uh, um, I, I, if you look at like Polar Bear International, there are polar bear biologists on the board. And it seems to me there's a conflict of interest there. If you're the polar bear biologist for Nunavut or whatever, for N Northwest Territories, I don't think you should be on the board of a conservation or preservationist organization. And of course, uh, Polar bear biologists have the iconic species. All apologies to bowheads, but polar bear are the iconic species. And so, uh, you know, you're guaranteed grant money. If you link climate change and polar bear, God, you'd be rolling in dough, you know? So uh, I, I got it, I, I've had my ups and downs and uh, the, uh, I'm trying to think now. I, when I was in Greenland back in the 80s, I ran into a biologist there, uh, uh, Eric Bourne. Uh, uh, he did walrus, he did polar bear and all kinds of stuff. And I had always hypothesized, and this is, goes way back, in, when, when I first came to Clyde, one of the things I was asked by somebody from Canadian Wildlife Service, actually, I was a grad student. The first time I, uh, second time I went to Clyde, so 1973, after coming to McGill. Um, he asked me, you know, what did people think of polar bear quotas? Because they were a fairly new thing. And I wrote a report, which probably, I probably still have, it disappeared. I'm sure, in the files. What I was told was people hated the quotas because it mistreated bears. It wasn't the right way to deal with bears. You shouldn't be hunting bears bec only because, you know, you could only catch 10. Because ultimately you were going to mis misuse, mistreat bears, and so on. I'm sure it got laughed away wherever. It was a short report, five, 10 pages. I wasn't into being very prolix at that time. And uh, then I, you know, out of mind, Clyde was at the end of, I mean, it was at the end of the airline. There were no wildlife officer there. The RCMP was at Cape Christian because there was a U.S. Coast Guard station there. So they were, they were basically doing customs. And so I just pay, didn't pay much attention. And then around 1984, a polar, the then polar bear biologist for the Northwest Territories did a really half-assed aerial survey in the, in the Baffin Bay area and basically wanted to see a moratorium brought in on polar bear hunting for the communities that exploited that region. Ultimately, that was politically couldn't be done, but they uh, uh, reduced the quota to 20. And then they also did a, what I consider not a very smart thing, was they paid the community $10,000 for every bear off that they didn't take from the former quota, which was ba very badly invested and so on. And it really w became money wasted. But uh, that's a whole, a whole other thing. <clears throat> it was essentially bribing people not to hunt polar bears. But at that time, what it came back to me what people had told me about the quota back in the 70s when I talked to them about it. And I talked to some of the people and they said, you know, linking those two things up because what people told me was the quota was going to make bears go to Greenland because there they use bears properly. They didn't have a quota. And to me, well, here you have your proof. It's 1984 and the biologists are telling you that you shouldn't be hunting any polar bears. Where Clyde had <coughs> the second highest polar bear quota in Canada, 42. <coughs> next to Sedlick, Coral Harbor. And, uh, excuse me, I've got to pop this back in. Um, <coughs> anyway, this went back and forth. It's been a bone of contention ever since. But uh, I've always said that, <coughs> you know, that it really need to be redone. And of course, doing polar bear surveys is hugely expensive. 
but th th I was convinced the numbers were wrong, not on any strong evidence, but for, just from what Inuit told me. And Eric, <coughs> many years later, it, he, he, public, he did a polar bear harvest study in Greenland, but it was a phone interviews. It was published in Medelez on Greenland, which is up there on the shelf someplace. And it's a really interesting study, except it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong is he very nicely put in as an appendix the questions he asked. And it's kind of like food security, where these days, you know, when they, when they, especially when they took the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, or Agricultural Administration's survey around poverty in Appalachia, it was, could you afford food? Well, that could never capture country food. The polar bear thing was, you know, did you get a bear? And fine. Uh, and so the, he came to the conclusion, Jesus, they're over hunting bears, but it's West Greenland. Well, many years ago, I try to remember the fellow's name. He was, I want to say, maybe from Sorbonne. I met him in a Glulik. You would know the name, certainly. He worked in a Glulik on animals, and I think it was partially ontology. Vladimir, Randa, maybe? Maybe. I cannot remember. But he published a book, okay, which, of all places, I was spent six months in Japan at the National Museum of Ethnology because of Nobuhiro. He invited me as a senior scholar. I gave, I had to give a couple of lectures during six months. So I, I was in, at, and they had a good library. And I came across this book, and I can read French, but not well. But his illustrations are captioned in English. And if you look closely at Polar Bear, for instance, the first three guys who catch the bear, help cut up the bear, can claim the part of the bear. So I, Bourne was asking people if they caught a bear. It could have been three guys with the same bear. But the question as, isn't worded that way. It's, did you catch a bear? So to this day, and Mitch Taylor thinks he's finally worked out that quantitatively uh, with, with some program that he's developed over time, that in fact there's been consistent undercounting of polar bears, certainly in the Baffin Bay Davis Strait population and probably everywhere, you know. So, uh, but I, 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 I don't, you know, I don't have on the ground proof, but just intuitively, we, we when I was a neophyte anthropologist, I was always told that you had to be careful. You never asked for yes, no answers, for instance. You had to be much more nuanced. Then you learned to do this. Like I learned at Clyde doing genealogies. If I asked who your sisters and brothers were, you never told me about who was in Arctic Bay. You, meant, you thought I meant who was in Clyde River. <laughs> so pretty soon I'd be fine. somebody would be sitting in a house two years later. Oh, that's my sister. You didn't tell me you had a sister in Arctic Bay. Well, you didn't ask. I thought you meant Clyde River. <laughs> so uh, just shows you come from archaeology. You you don't know how to ask questions of life people. And uh, well, I'm going to wrap up this segment uh, for sure. Maybe a bit uh, about some sometimes hunting can seem like business. Ah, uh, yeah. Say, no? Okay. Um, well, the fact was that for the people who not so much the guides, but particularly in Clyde River, Grease Fjord, uh, Resolute, although the HTO votes the tags for sport hunting, th initially the tags go f gratis to local outfitters. The only place that didn't happen was to Lojuac, where they ran, the HTO ran the sport hunt. So in Clyde, uh, you had a guy, a guy ran a business, basically. And that's where that came from. Sometimes hunting feels like business. Because it wasn't the same to him. And there was a really interesting, this is another CBC program, which I taped. And I have no idea where the tape is. It was done by Josh Freed, who writes for the Montreal Gazette. Uh, Saturday, he, he columns around Montreal. <laughs> 
But he went up north with a photographer, a videographer, and they went on a sport polar bear hunt. Actually, with a guy I interviewed, although I wasn't there at the time. It, and it's really interesting because it was originally, I believe, a 12-day hunt. And he, this guy was doing one of the things that drives Inuit crazy. They'll pass on small bears. It's too small. Well, to Inuit, what do you mean it's too small? You know, the whole concept of trophy and larger being better trophy, you know. And sports hunters would always tell me, one of the big attractions of the sport hunt and why it's an apex hunt is that only one in every thousand trophy rooms has a, a polar bear. Some guys would say 10,000, but one in a thousand. And, uh, and by the way, when I was in Las Vegas, the hall that they had their show in would run from, I would say, McTavish to St. Urban. There were 800 booths. People who came through paid $150. And you had everything from the government of Botswana to uh, uh, Beretta, $10,000 shotguns being uh, exhibited. And there were full body mounts of every possible animal except elephants and giraffes. Even walrus were there. There had to be 10 or 12 polar bears. It was the most disgusting experience I've ever had other than being in La Las Vegas is one of the few places you could pull this off as far as I was concerned. But uh, I should also say this is a personal thing. I have an antipathy to gambling because my parents gambled and it was always a bone of contention. And it always from being middle, middle class to not being to being not really middle, middle class because there was always more losing than winning going on. To this day, the only game I'll play is Patek, mostly to lose, because that's how I distribute grant money. <laughs>